The Watergate break-in that ultimately led to President Richard Nixon's resignation happened 50 years ago. In this episode of C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast, John Dean teaches a class about Watergate and the discovery of the White House taping system. During testimony before the Senate Watergate Committee in June 1973, John Dean implicated President Nixon and administration officials, including himself, in the Watergate cover-up. They keyed the taping system to this, to the, to the, uh, the locator, so that when he was in the room where the taping system was employed and installed, it would trigger the taping system. In other words, installing it in the Oval Office, unless Nixon was there and, say, the cleaning crew's in there at midnight, uh, it won't activate the system. Mr. Dean later pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice for his role in Watergate and served four months in prison. This lecture, originally aired in 2016, is hosted by Arizona State University. Discovering the taping system, was it lucky or inevitable, is what we're looking at in this sixth lecture. The Nixon taping, the whole story of the Nixon tapes, uh, has been only partially told. It's taken me years to gather and find out what happened. And since it's one of the most important factors in the Watergate story, I think it's important to get that history straight. Uh, And we're going to try to do that in a very summary fashion today. Before I start, though, I'd like to remind you that other presidents did tape, uh, starting with Franklin Roosevelt, who used a... When they first went to talkie movies and they had a soundtrack, he had a system that was put in the Oval Office that recorded. I'm going to try a very, very quick sample. Oops, let me go back. A uh, quick sample of, of Roosevelt taping. Let me go back. All right, you get a sample there. Uh, let me give you a... Uh, that's kind of an amazing when you think he's... Somebody today, when we have cell phones, is talking about the breakthrough uh, in that presidency of a walkie-talkie that was so heavy they had to carry it on their back. Anyway, Nixon got the idea of taping from Lyndon Johnson, his immediate predecessor. During the recess, or excuse me, the transition between the two presidencies, Nixon and Johnson met, and he said, I have several of the offices wired for recording, including several of the telephones. And he said, I strongly recommend you do the same. Nixon had exactly the opposite reaction and had them all taken out. Uh, But this is the first time he had heard of president's recording. So what were the reasons that he does install? Well, back in the Nixon White House, there was, as we have discussed in prior lectures, a pretty efficient management system, excepting for those instances like Watergate and a few others where the management system did not come into play. But the management system on a daily basis was there. When somebody had a meeting with the president, when they brought a guest in, they prepared a talking paper that went into the president, was approved by Haldeman first, then went into the president, Uh, And then after the meeting, they were prepared a summary of the meeting. Let me give you a a for example. In this particular memo from Bud Krogh, Elvis Presley shows up at the Northwest Gate. Uh, I happen to know of this because Bud called me and said, Elvis is at the gate and he he wants to present the president with a gun. Uh, It's a silver gun with ivory handles. But he also wants to talk about law enforcement. What should I do? I said, I said, have the Secret Service handle it, which they did. Uh, 
that, 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 that talking memo, that, or excuse me, that memo that went into the president mentioned uh, that, uh, why Elvis was there and laid it out in some detail that Elvis had sent a letter. I kind of like this letter. If you read it, you'll see uh, Elvis starts, Dear Mr. President, I would like to introduce myself. I am Elvis Presley as if anybody in that era would have had any trouble knowing who this was. And I admire you and the office, and respect the office, uh, have great respect for your office. I talked to Vice President Agnew in Palm Springs three weeks ago and expressed concern for the country. So this is why Elvis is coming in. What he really wants to do is be deputized as a law enforcement, federal law enforcement officer, to deal with a drug problem. Uh, there's the letter. Uh, Bud takes him in to the Oval Office. They agree that he should come in. Uh, and Elvis, uh, this is the, the greeting, and Elvis starts showing him pictures. And uh, it, it's a, Much of the meeting was recorded. Uh, that's Bud Krogh in the picture there. Uh, this is one of the most requested pictures of the Nixon administration. <coughs> Excuse me. And you'll notice here this belt, which is solid gold. Uh, he was also showing the president his gold cufflinks. Bud Krogh was, was not the normal note taker of meetings and prepared a fairly detailed account of what had happened uh, after the meeting. This actually runs several pages. I've clipped just one paragraph here. Uh, that notes that Pre Presley indicated that he thought the Beatles had been a real force for anti-American spirit. He said, that this sounds a little bit my competition, uh, he said that the Beatles came to the country, made their money, and returned to England where they promoted an anti-American theme. The president nodded in agreement and expressed some surprise. This is more, as I say, this is, this is a good post-meeting memo. This is, became the exception to the rule. Uh, no greater offender than Henry Kissinger, who fell way behind on his meetings and the record of it. Haldeman noticed this and decided he had to do something about it. He decided that, you know, we're not keeping a good record of this presidency. What Nixon wanted were really two things. One, he wanted the historical record of what had happened during his presidency. He had a real sense of history. Secondly, he wanted to know if he had said something or given some indication to the guest, like uh, nodding that the Beatles were doing something. Uh, he wanted a record of that. Uh, that. So somebody couldn't leave the office and say that he had said something that he, in fact, had not said. Uh, he, did not, he did not fully agree with Elvis in this. He just sort of nodded and showed some surprise. So Elvis uh, could not, with Bud there taking notes, go out and say the president hates the Beatles because that would have been an untrue statement. So Nixon wants to protect himself. That's one of the reasons he, he has somebody in there taking notes, particularly with outsiders. To deal with this problem and the breakdown of this recording system, uh, the, the paper recording system, Haldeman and Nixon discuss, let's put the same sort of system in that Lyndon Johnson had or something similar and keep a, an audio record of it. Uh, Haldeman calls uh, an aide he can trust because this would become one of the most closely guarded secrets of this presidency. Calls Alex Butterfield, uh, who is the deputy assistant to the president, who is the person who's dealing with the president more than anybody else, uh, other than Haldeman and actually more FaceTime than Haldeman because he's the person who takes documents in and out. Haldeman in turn, excuse me, uh, uh, Butterfield in turn calls the Secret Service the Technical Services Division. They're the people who made sure that nobody outside the White House was bugging the White House or none of the White House lines were being bugged. Uh, so they had the capability and the understanding. Uh, Butterfield has told me uh, over the years that when he went to uh, Al Wong, the head of the Technical Services Division, uh, Wong said, oh, here we go again, that he had been there while this had happened in prior presidency. So he knew exactly what it was. Uh, what was different, however, is that they put in 
a voice-activated system. Isn't that an annoying video? <laughs> what it means to have had a, a voice-activated system is that any time Nixon spoke, it triggered the recording. And the way it worked is Nixon carried a small device on his belt or in his pocket that indicated his location. It sent out a beam. It was really a, a locator, so the Secret Service knew if he was in the barber shop or if he was in the Oval Office or if he'd gone up to the residence and taken it off. They keyed the taping system to this, to the, to the, uh, the locator, so that when he was in the room where the taping system was employed and installed, it would trigger the taping system. In other words, installing it in the Oval Office, unless Nixon was there and say the cleaning crew's in there at midnight, uh, it won't activate the system uh, unless Nixon happened to be there with his, uh, his locator. So that's, and it's very clear that Nixon and Haldeman, Haldeman less, forget about the recording system. There's other times they clearly remember the recording system. Uh, as somebody who's gone through as many of these as I have, I, you, you can hear it when he's trying to make a record, even with outsiders as opposed to just insiders. They start in the Oval Office. Here are the locations of the microphones in the Oval Office. Uh, as you can see, that there's one up here. This is actually down by the president's feet. Uh, you've seen a couple of pictures where the president has his feet up on the desk. The fact that he would often be talking through his legs distorted the sound, and one of the reasons it's very difficult to hear Nixon. Uh, I tended to sit in this seat right here by M5, and I, my, my voice must have been right beside the microphone because it's very clearly picked up. Uh, M4, Ehrlichman tended to take that seat, Haldeman, M2, and M3 for Kissinger. It's just bizarre how people would go back to the same places with, uh, in repeated fashion. So those are those where the where the mics were located, uh, and then there were two over here uh, by the fireplace in the lamps. Uh, that, to my no I, I cannot hear anything from those. Uh, they tend to make the room sound rather hollow when they got picked up, uh, but that's the key system. The other, the next place they put them were in the EOB office. Uh, same thing in the desk. The problem, as I er earlier alluded to, is nobody sat by the desk. Uh, they sat, there's a seating arrangement over here on the far corner. And so these are some of the most difficult to understand. Uh, some of the best recordings are those on the telephone. Most every, t every telephone the president used, excepting some in the residence that he occasionally would use, but were not more often used by the family, uh, they all were wired through the switchboard, and they're very good. Uh, this is the one recording device in the residence in the Lincoln sitting room, and uh, this little princess phone up here is wired because it goes through the, uh, uh, the central switchboard system. He also had, he had actually three tapes up in Camp David, uh, two different telephones. There was one uh, that was by a sofa, another on his desk, and then the room was recorded. So there were three up there. They were put in in stages, not all at once. Uh, the final place that was wired, and some of the most difficult sound because it was, the wiring just didn't work the way it was set up, it was the cabinet room. Uh, this was actually controlled outside the cabinet room by Alex Butterfield, who had a, his telephone had a button that would result in his turning on. And when Alex left, it was, went over to Steve Bull. If Alex knew he was going to be in the cabinet meeting himself for some reason as the staff secretary, uh, he would have one of the secretaries turn it on. The system starts in February 16 of 1971. Uh, that date, for some reason, is not easily remembered by most people who write about this, but that's, that's when it happened. Uh, the first conversation, other than a, a very general one here, let me go back, uh, is some, actually somebody who just walked in the office before Alex did, and they don't even really number uh, it to speak of, and the first 450 
dash one is the first af- Oval Office test. Yes. had no control over them. They're all voice activated. Uh, you all hear the question up there, was the only way to turn them on, uh, where Nixon had no control over them. Nixon had no control over them. Uh, and as I say, at times he's very aware they're being recorded, other times he clearly has forgotten. Anyway, the first conversation, this was surely explained to Nixon. Uh, he, he, he tells the operation of it, the purpose of it, the fact that the cabinet room is controlled by Butterfield, the fact that it's being monitored, uh, and who knows? Haldeman, the president, the Secret Service. Under Haldeman also, Larry Higby uh, and, of course, Butterfield were the other two. Uh, Higby because he carried messages back and forth. The recordings were being made on a Sony recording system. Uh, this, that's what the system looked like. They, at one point, they had up to nine of these machines that were gathering information. Uh, they were gathered on a very thin tape, a half a millimeter, and it played at the slowest speed possible, 15 sixteenths per inch, or inch per second, on a six-inch reel. This translated into about six hours per reel. One of the reasons the sound quality is so bad is because of the fact it was played so slowly. In addition, the fact it was voice activated creates what they call tape tape whip, where the machine starts, it jerks at, at the start, and that leaves a kind of a blurry sound, audio sound, uh, that sometimes starts at the, at the beginning of a conversation. So it, technically, it's not very sophisticated, but it lasted for many, many years until anybody really got serious about listening to them. Ironically, by April 9 of 1973, Nixon is talking about taking the system out. Uh, he, there is a taped conversation that I have in the the text, the the Nixon defense. Uh, If you look at uh, April 9, what he says in there, he says, you know, with regard to the recording what's going on here in the room, I feel uneasy about that. Not uneasy in terms of anybody else seeing it because we'll control it, but uneasy because of the fact it's even being done. This this results in a 20-minute conversation, which I... Uh, seriously summarized here. Uh, But what he comes down on is he said, what I would like to do uh, is destroy them, in essence, and take them all out, take what we've got, and get rid of them. As the conversation goes on, Haldeman argues with him there might be some valuable material in here, particularly in the area of foreign affairs, uh, but he doesn't disagree with him. What I found, that, that was known before I did, did the, uh, the Nixon defense, but I found another conversation where this comes up, and it's on April 18th. Uh, let's listen to this. I'd like for you to take all these tapes, if you wouldn't mind. In other words, uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to you know, there's some material there, it's probably worth keeping. Yeah. Most of it's worth destroying. Would you, like, would you do that, sir? Wyndham Hotels and Resorts makes travel possible for all. Whether it's the long haulers looking for a great cup of coffee, a roomier rest for the on-a-whim road trippers, or a place to make summer memories with the whole family. No matter who you are, where you're going, or why, with 24 trusted brands to choose from like La Quinta, Days Inn, and Super 8, your Wyndham is waiting. Get the lowest price at WyndhamHotels.com. Restrictions apply. Visit website for more details. Holloman never did do that. As best I can figure, the reason he doesn't do anything is that he becomes so consumed by Watergate that he just absolutely doesn't have time to do it. He never, on record, reports back to Nixon it hasn't been done. Uh, And so they will stay in place and continue playing until they're revealed by Butterfield, uh, as we've discussed earlier. And that happens on June 18th is when... They, uh, the system is shut down. There are approximately 4,000 hours. Many of them are classified. I think that the, the official number by the archives is, is 3,700 hours. 
Uh, here is a, <laughs> an eye-twisting sheet that I used uh, at the time I was working on the book. Uh, it was released in October of 2010, but it just shows how, you know, it's interesting to see where the conversations were. This is the White House telephone. This is the cabinet room. This is Camp David telephone. This is the Camp da second Camp David telephone. Uh, this is called the, the hard wire, which covers the room in Camp David at Laurel Lodge. This is the EOB office. This is the Oval Office. You can see most of the conversations take place in the Oval Office and the EOB and uh, the telephone. The cabinet room, there are a number of tapes, but the quality is so bad, they're barely discernible. Uh, but that's just kind of an, the, the gray part are those that were not released yet by the time I had uh, started on the project that resulted in finding uh, a thousand conversations, 600 of which had never been previously released. So how, how was this system uncovered? How did we learn about this system? Uh, I think that the, it, it really starts right I here. I do not, in fact, know if such a tape exists. But if it does exist and has not been tampered with and is a complete transcript of the entire conversation that took place in the president's office, I think this committee should have that tape because it, I believe it would, be, it would corroborate many of the things that this committee has asked me to testify Mr. About. Chairman, this concludes my rather lengthy statement. I apologize again for its length, but I sought to comply with the committee's request to provide the committee with a broad overview of my knowledge of this matter. The... Uh also, during there were a number of people who raised the fact I thought I had been taped in cross-examination, uh, including Sam Dash in this clip right here. Why I was focusing on April 15th, uh, some of this is slightly repeated just to make the point, is that Nixon had said after we met on April 15th that he had a tape of me claiming I had immunity. He clearly misunderstood what I was saying when I said I had informally been immunized by the prosecutors to talk to them off the record about what was going on. I was very open with my colleagues about all these things. And he just misunderstands it and tells Peterson in a phone call that he thinks that I, he, he says, I'm claiming I have been immunized. Well, I, I never made such a claim. So say, I think it's just a fundamental misunderstanding. Uh, but the whole word and buzz gets out, uh, and Peterson starts raising it with my lawyer. Uh, the dean said he thinks he was, has immunity. He doesn't have it. Uh, and Charlie, my lawyer, said he doesn't think he has immunity. He has exactly what he was given, was informal immunity to discuss this on an off-of-the-record basis with the prosecutors. So here, here is that point coming up in cross-examination. I think you testified, and you may have given us information on this, that you believed that that April 15th meeting with the president was taped and that you were being asked leading questions. Have you ever asked the White House if you were taped or any official of the White House? I raised with my lawyer, and I don't know what he, whether he raised this with, with the prosecutors or not, that after I was told that uh, I had been taped... Who, who told you, Mr. Dean? Mr. Sh my lawyer, Mr. Schaffer, told me that he had received word from the prosecutors that I had been taped, and I thought there was only one occasion where that could have occurred that I was aware of, where I had a direct conversation with the president, uh, because all the circumstances seemed to indicate that, and uh, that was on this uh, April 15th meeting. Now, I don't know for a fact whether I was or was not taped, but suggested that the government might want to listen to that tape, because if they listened to that tape, they'd have some idea of the dimensions of uh, what was involved. The people who got uh, on this issue uh, were Sam Dash and Fred Thompson. Uh, Fred Thompson representing the minority and really being there at the request of Howard Baker. In fact, the minority was somewhat more aggressive in one aspect than the majority. But yet, uh, that's Fred Thompson, who passed away recently, uh, who, if you didn't recognize him in his earlier incarnation as a first a, a staffer in the Senate and then later a U.S. senator, uh, would have sold you a reverse mortgage uh, for many years. Uh, Scott Armstrong, who did work for Sam Dash, uh, was probably the most aggressive 
not knowing exactly what he's looking for, uh, but I'm convinced would have ultimately run into it one way or the other. The person who asks the direct question is Don Sanders, who works for the minority, a lawyer. And they will ask Alex Butterfield. Uh, to give you a little background of, of, of how that all happened, uh, there was a memo sent to Fred Thompson from Buzzhart, uh, Buzzhart being the re- one half of my replacement as White House counsel who handled nothing but Watergate after I departed the White House. Uh, there was a document prepared that was pretty close to a transcript and a summary of all my conversations with Nixon that was given to Fred Thompson by uh, Buzzhart. And it was remarkably accurate. It goes on for several pages. Uh, this, this, is what makes, this is what makes Scott Armstrong wonder where could this information have come from. Uh, so this will, I think, a combination of things, uh, there's a sort of a confluence in Watergate constantly, result in the Senate Watergate Committee uncovering the taping system. Here is a recap of that in a summary form uh, being recalled from... And I made an organization... I was a systems analyst, among other things, and I made an organization chart of the White House. And the question was, here's Nixon, here's Dean. We already knew from John's testimony that John didn't have notes, so there wasn't going to be paper documentation, so we had to figure out who else would know. So we made a satellite chart of all the people that were in touch with Nixon, all the people who were in touch with Dean. And in the middle of this, I mean, literally, if you here's Dean up here, and you looked at this chart, this a flow chart, effectively of where information flowed, and there was the office of the Council of the President, and there was this guy who controlled everything in and out of the President's office, named Alexander Butterfield, that we were using to reconstruct. Once you get uh, Alex in there, uh, what happens? Well, it's, it's a it's Friday the 13th, and we met in the the air conditioned. Uh, uh, basement of the uh, yeah, Dirksen Senate office building. Alexander Butterfield walks in and he's doesn't, not accompanied by counsel, which was very rare. And then at the end of it, I took out this bizarre to Thompson memo. I took off the front part that indicated exactly what it was and gave him the part that described the meetings between the It president. was like a summary of, a, of a transcript, but it was, but it was, it was in the sense, and everything had a twist that was tracked what Dean's testimony had been, and it was, uh, it was prepared before Dean's testimony, but it always had this twist that Dean was the one responsible for whatever the evil act was at the end, if there was something that they th- was afraid was going to come out. So I, with this document, and I handed it to Alex, and I said, can you explain, given the systems you just described, how this would be reconstructed? What, what's it from? And we went through the president's dick to belts, all the different things, things that... And... Uh, is, my recollection is that Alex took it and looked at it. And he'd been very straightforward. Uh, he continued, but he said, well, this is, and I asked a couple of questions. I said, well, could this have come from the president's recollections on a dicta belt? No, too detailed for that. Could this have come from, you know, somebody else being present at the meetings? No, John would have been the only note taker, and we know, already knew that John didn't have notes. And so we went on like this, and I said, well, where did this come from? And Alex took it and very deliberately took it and set it down in front of himself, said, well, let me think about that for a minute. And the questioning went off, and uh, I I finished up the questioning uh, Don Sanders, very skilled FBI agent. Obviously, there's one other aspect. I I went back later and looked at the the stenographer's notes, and and this is what she has down. uh, Memory is what it is, but uh, she was just taking notes. Sanders asked a number of different questions about different things, and it was. And he asked a, the question jumped around a little, and then he asked the question: When Dean testified, he said that at one point in one of the meetings, Nixon went over to the corner of his EOB office and lowered his voice when he was talking about. I think it was the the uh, clemency for the the, the, the clemency uh, questions, and or uh, I, I had the impression there might have been some money conversations. But at any rate. He, uh, uh, Sanders said Dean thought that the president lowered his voice and wondered, and Dean speculated that the president, uh, that the, the conversations might have been recorded. Uh, did, Dean, did Dean know what he was talking about? Was the, I've forgotten the exact language, but it was close to that. 
And Alex's answer was, no. Dean wouldn't have known. There were very few of us that knew, but that's where this came from and picked up the, the thing as a con continuation. That, the way it affected me was, I thought he was answering my question rather than Sanders' question. I mean, until, until I looked at the, the, the transcript later. As soon as we heard that, um, this little tingle went up your spine and said, oh, there's going to be recordings of all the, because we then ask him the nature of the system. The only thing I remember differently from what <clears throat> Scott just said, I remember getting that piece of paper early on in the, uh, shortly after two o'clock in that four hour session with the staff. And uh, Scott was the lead investigator. And I remember it as only one sheet of paper. And when I, they said, where might this have come from? I looked at this thing and it, it, it was in fact, it looked exactly like a, uh, a transcript, a verbatim transcript. It had a P for president, a D for dean, and it made sense. It was a, I mean, I didn't f follow the discussion, but I, I thought to myself, God, it's out. This had to come from the tapes. The very thing I'm worrying so much about. And uh, so I just, I hemmed and hawed and said, uh, gee, this looks very detailed. Uh, the president had great retentive powers, but this is too detailed for that. Anyway, I, I said, finally, I sort of panicked. I threw it back down. It slid out to the center of this little conference table. And I said, let me think about that for a while. And uh, to my great relief, they went on to other items until Sanders was, uh, until Scott turned it over to Sanders, representing Fred Thompson. He was the minority uh, uh, deputy and, counsel. And as I had said to my wife at breakfast that morning, if they, I guess, if they ask me a direct question, I will just have to answer. And know that, I mean, I knew it would be the end of my, my career. But the question then became, how do we get to this material quickly? He told us who else knew about it, how it was organized and run, and we had to get to it from my point of view, before it was destroyed. In other words, we had, to, we had to do something to nail it down. Anyway, that's about 40 minutes boiled down to eight. What happens next is that after he has Sam's full attention, they say, well, I can't deal with it tonight, but we're going to deal with it in the morning. This is Friday afternoon, Friday evening, uh, the 13th, uh, Friday the 13th. And... Uh, Sam says the next morning, he has all of his staff in, we've got to get a hold of John Dean because he's our key witness. What if everything he's told us and we've built this whole case on is wrong? And this is all a setup. And that's why Butterfield is up here and has actually finally revealed this rather uh, astounding piece of information. So Sam Dash, rather than he would normally call my lawyer, called me directly. He was able to get in touch with me because he knew I was in the witness protection program. And so through the marshals, he tracked me down to, to uh, Marathon, Florida, where I was staying in a friend's house on a rather deserted beach, uh, with lowering my profile uh, as much as possible after 80 million Americans uh, watching a week of the testimony. So uh, Sam says, you've got to return. The, the marshals will get you back up to your house. And I need to meet with you on Sunday uh, at the latest uh, on something I can't tell you about. I thought that was mysterious. But he said, I said, well, if it's that important, Sam, I'd known Sam for many years, long before Watergate, and I trusted him. So I said, OK, I'll, I will, we'll work it out. Uh, the next Sunday, I would meet with him at my house in Old Town. Uh, the marshals would have no trouble uh, arranging the travel as they were able to do for people in the witness protection program and accompanied me up there and got me. And uh, when Sam came out, he would be accompanied by Jim Hamilton, who was one of his key lawyers. So in, in assembling this program, uh, I have got a hold of Jim Hamilton and to ask him if he'd ever really discussed this issue. He says, as a matter of fact, I have a video I did in the Howard Baker uh, room of the University of Tennessee uh, 
uh, and I'll be happy to send you up a transcript of it or a, a video of it. So here's a little clip from what happened from uh, uh, Jim Hamilton's recollection of these events. When Sam Dash called me early Saturday morning, July 14th, he said, let's go tell John Dean what we've just learned. And a little later, Sam picked me up, and we drove to Dean's townhouse in Alexander, Virginia. Uh, John and his glamorous, glamorous wife, the always well put together Mo, uh, met us at the front door. And John had a quizzical look in his face because he didn't yet know uh, what the purpose of the visit was. So we went upstairs to their living room. And John and Bo sat on a couch. And after some preliminary conversation, uh, Sam sat down to their left. And I stood before John and Bo by the mantelpiece, where I could look directly at John, because I wanted to see John's reaction when Sam told him what we now knew about the taping system. When uh, Sam finally did, John broke into a wide smile, for he knew that the tapes essentially were going to confirm his damning testimony about President Nixon. As John recounts it in his book, Blind Ambition, he then said to Sam, Sam, do you know what this means if you get those conversations? It would mean my ass is not hanging out there all alone. It means that you can verify my testimony. And I'll tell you this, you'll find out that I've under-testified rather than over-testified just to be careful. On Monday morning, uh, the next Monday morning, July 16th, Irwin, Baker, Dash, and Thompson met, met, and they decided to put Butterfield on the stand that afternoon. I was dispatched to summon Butterfield to the hearings. When I told Butterfield that his presence was required that afternoon, he was not happy. Indeed, he refused to appear. He said that he was preparing for a trip to Russia uh, the next day on FAA business and was just too busy to attend the hearings. I relayed Butterfield's response to Senator Irwin. Sam Urban grew agitated. His famous eyebrows uh, cavorted, his jaw churned, and finally he said to me, Jim, you tell Mr. Butterfield that if he's not here this afternoon, I will send the Senate sergeant at arms out to fetch him and bring him to the hearing. Which, uh, having located him in a barber chair, I did faithfully. Uh, this message uh, changed his mind and later that afternoon, uh, Butterfield, now quite contrite and neatly quaffed, arrived at the Senate <laughs> at the Senate to give his electrifying uh, testimony. The subpoena I served on Butterfield still hangs in my office. The interesting and I think very uh, clever decision that the Democrats made was rather than f for the Sam Dash to ask this question of Butterfield because it had been uncovered by Don Sanders who worked for the minority and the Republicans they would have the Republicans ask Butterfield the question uh, since Don Sanders had discovered this in other words to have Fred Thompson raise the questions uh, this gave it a little different feel with the Republicans under uncovering this incredible bit of information. Uh, in the clip that follows, I believe you can see uh, Howard Baker on the far side of the screen. Uh, he looks like he's ill after having found this information out. January 21st, 1969, and continued to be employed until March 14 of this year. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of 
listening devices? Yes, sir. When were those devices placed in the Oval Office? Approximately the summer of 1970. I cannot begin to recall the precise date. My guess, Mr. Thompson, is that the installation was made between, and this is a very rough guess, April or May of 1970 and perhaps the end of the summer or early fall 1970. Are you aware of any devices that were installed in the executive office building office of the president? Yes, sir, at that time. Were they installed at the same time? They were installed at the same time. Actually, the dates are a little bit wrong. He, if you recall, I showed you February 16th of 71 is when the system was put in the uh, Oval Office. The next was the Cabinet Room. A little bit later after that, the EOB office. On Jim Hamilton's uh, recollection of his meeting with me, he's, he's nailed it. He's right on, except in showing the kind of tricks that memory can play. He vividly remembers my wife being there. She was not there. Uh, she remained in Marathon, Florida. Uh, but that's the sort of thing a memory can do. Uh, it was just myself, and then I actually returned to Marathon as soon as the, uh, the meeting with Sam Dash ended. And needless to say, the, the fact the taping system had been uncovered was quickly conveyed to the White House. Uh, Fred Thompson called Fred Buzzhart to let him know, and found him not overly concerned. Uh, I think Buzzhart had figured it out by then that there was such a system uh, because he had made the memo that was sent to Thompson that so closely uh, had the notes of my conversations. Today I know, and you know as reading, from reading the book, that what happened is Nixon himself listen to his conversations with me, most of them. He never listens until years after the fact to the March 21st conversation, but he listens to the earlier conversations uh, because he set his defense on being no information before March 21 about a cover-up. So he listens to the earlier conversations to hear if there was anything in there that put the lie to his defense. Well, it's marginal. You could argue either way on some of the conversations. It's clear today, we know that he knew of the, converse, of, of the cover-up before I came in to tell him, but then it wasn't quite so clear. Uh, so he's confronted with the question of what to do with the tapes once they have been revealed. Uh, Len Garment is, his, is one of the people who became White House counsel, and the other was Fred Buzzhart. They both, the two of them, had the job together. Uh, Garment tended to handle the non-Watergate matters with Buzzhart handling the Watergate matters. Uh, Garment was a former law partner of Richard Nixon, had a long relationship to him, is the man who prepared him when he gave his one argument before the Supreme Court uh, when he was still in private practice and before he'd been elected. Uh, Len was a good trial lawyer. Uh, Buzzhart had been the general counsel of the Defense Department, had come from Capitol Hill, where he'd worked for a number of prominent and powerful senators. Uh, when a addressing the question of whether Nixon should destroy his tapes, Len Garment had sent one of his assistants to the law library in the Department of Justice and found a case that was pretty much on point that showed if somebody destroyed evidence that they knew would likely be subpoenaed, it was obstruction of justice. Uh, Buzzhart, however, when they went out to visit Nixon, who is in the Naval Hospital, which this is the picture of, uh, he argues to the contrary. He says he has a case that shows that since they have not been subpoenaed, there is no obstruction of justice. In over four decades, I've never found Buzzhart's case, so I'm not quite sure what he was referring to. Uh, I have found Garment's case. Nixon decides he doesn't want to hear about it and sends them both away without making a decision. Uh, but this starts the fight for the tapes. 
this is really where the Nixon defense ends and the rest is summary because once the tapes are discovered, within days, uh, Al Haig, who is now the chief of staff, having replaced Haldeman, he literally gives an order without even the president's consent to stop the taping system. So it is, the, the plug is pulled on, on, on July 18th, uh, and that's the last conversation, or that's the last day the, the system is in. Uh, Buzz, or, or excuse me, Haig also, Mar, he, he knew there was something, but he thought it was controllable by Nixon, and that's why he had tapes of me that Nixon had the foresight to somehow record the people he thought he should and not the other. When he learned it was voice activated, he was dumbfounded because he knew he was on the tapes too at that point, which made him very unhappy. I think that's when the plug was pulled is when he learned that he was voice activated. The, the Senate committee immediately sends a subpoena for the tapes and they want them and it becomes the focus of Watergate for the rest of the story is really the fight for the tapes. Ironically, Judge Sirica, who is the first to rule on this, denies the Senate the tapes, says that they don't have the standing to sue, that it's a political question, uh, and he passes on it. However, Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor who'd also filed a subpoena, uh, Sirica says, is entitled on behalf of the grand jury. It's an interesting breakdown where the judge is clearly protecting the court system. A grand jury is a part of the court system. It is under the jurisdiction of the chief judge, which Sirica was. So he said, I will hunt those tapes, but I'm not going to give them to the Senate committee. Uh, we're going to take this through the judicial process on behalf of the courts and the grand jury. So, that's, that, so Cox wins his argument that the grand jury should get them. By October of, uh, of 73, although there are earlier indications, Nixon initially, when Cox was appointed special prosecutor, thought it was a great idea because he, th he thinks and thought Cox was weak and would never really pursue him all the way. So he was happy to hear Cox getting this appointment. However, by, uh, as Cox keeps pushing for the tapes, he keeps making noises that they might have to get rid of him. Uh, and he comes up with an idea after Sirica says Cox is entitled to the tapes that will be sort of a, a middling deal. He says, I will, I will make arrangements for Senator John Stennis, former judge, somebody in the Senate at the time who nobody would in question his integrity, that he can listen to the tapes make transcripts of the tapes, and give them to Cox. And that's what he wants Cox to accept. There's a real flaw, a couple of flaws in this plan. First of all, it was well known that John Stennis was almost deaf. Little problem to listen to these very difficult to hear tapes. But even more important, for Stennis to make a record of them and then pass them to the special prosecutor, they were useless to the, the prosecutor because they were hearsay at that point. Uh, they, were not, they were not the tapes themselves. They were a, a version of what Stennis had heard or not heard and passed on and really not admissible in evidence probably. As a result, Cox decides to, excuse me, uh, yeah, Cox decides to hold a press conference. Uh, at the press club on a Saturday uh, in October and says to the press, I'm going to not accept the Stennis compromise. It's unacceptable. And he explained the reasons why he couldn't accept it. Uh, it was really kind of Cox's, who was a very mild manner, sort of retiring personality, uh, became a national figure as a result of this. When Nixon hears this, he gives orders to fire Cox, that he is a part of the executive branch as a special prosecutor. He's been appointed by the uh, Department of Justice under the authority of the Attorney General. Uh, and what has happened, the reason we even have a special prosecutor, 
is that when Kleindienst left, along with Holliman, Ehrlichman, and Dean, uh, there was a vacancy. To get Elliot Richardson appointed attorney general, he had to make a deal with the Senate committee that he would appoint a special prosecutor. And he lays out all the criteria when he becomes attorney general and pledges to them that he will honor this agreement if he becomes attorney general. So when Elliot is told to fire Cox, he says, I can't do it. I am going to resign. So Nixon, through Al Haig, says, let's call his deputy, Bill Ruckelshaus, and have him do it. Ruckelshaus says, I'm going to resign too. I will not do it as a matter of principle. The next person in line in the Department of Justice is the Solicitor General, who is Robert Bork. Bork will carry out the order and fire Cox and forever be labeled by doing it. What a lot of people have missed in in Bork's action is the argument that both Richardson and Ruckelshaus made to him that only chaos could ensue if he didn't act because after you leave the, the third man in charge of the Department of Justice, it is any man's bet who has the authority. Indeed, the janitor might be able to say that he could be the acting attorney general. It was a very unclear situation. So they put a lot of pressure on Bork to, to do it, uh, and he did it. He would, it would cost him a, a seat on the Supreme Court later when Reagan nominated him uh, because of the, the, the hard feelings that would continue amongst Democrats for decades about Cox, Bork's action in firing Cox. Here is a clip of what happened the night that Cox was fired. All the networks, I happened to be watching television and learned about it that night, uh, and I had just pled guilty uh, a few days earlier, thinking that Cox was going to do this right, and I had agreed to cooperate with him and, and, and proceed accordingly. So I was somewhat stunned uh, when this interruption occurred, and I was able to locate uh, that clip. Nelson Benton at the White House. President Nixon has discharged Archibald Cox as Watergate's special prosecutor and has abolished the special prosecution office. As a result of Prosecutor Cox being discharged, Attorney General Elliot Richardson has resigned his post as Attorney General, and when Deputy Attorney General William Ruckelshaus refused to carry out orders from the president, he was discharged as deputy attorney general. Uh, the acting attorney general now will be Solicitor General Bork, who informed Special Prosecutor Cox that he had been discharged. All of this happened after a day in which Special Prosecutor Cox had said that he could not carry out the provisions of a new position that the president took on the Watergate tapes, which Prosecutor Cox was trying to get for the Watergate grand jury and which the Senate Watergate committee was trying to get for its hearings. Repeating, Deputy Attorney General William Ruckel's house has been discharged by the president. The president, uh, Attorney General Elliot Richardson has resigned all of this following the discharge of Watergate special prosecutor uh, Archibald Cox. This is Nelson Benton at the White House. This has been a bulletin from CBS News. They, all of the announcements were pretty breathless like that. You can tell everybody was shocked, surprised, gasping, uh, and it was really a stunning event. Uh, the next day's headlines, you can see, were the lead that Nixon had forced the firing of Cox. Uh, it, it, this is why it was called the, the Saturday Night Massacre. massacre. Uh, which became the, uh, the moniker for the events that weekend. As a result, on Monday, everything really changed. Forty-four Watergate resolutions and bills were introduced on Monday the 23rd. Thirty-two of them called for impeachment proceedings. Twelve of them called for the appointment of a special prosecutor. The Congress had really done nothing on impeachment 
until this moment. Uh, this was one of those pivot points in this story. As a result of all this, the White House is pretty shocked. They, they did not foresee why, I don't know. It was pretty predictable. But uh, Nixon decides on Monday, the 23rd, that, uh, that he's going to give Sirica nine of the subpoenaed tapes uh, eight of which are with me, and the other one was the June 20th conversation, which we'll later learn had the famous 18-and-a-half-minute gap. He also decides that he will select a new special prosecutor, uh, Leon Jaworski, which was, I think he felt, a safe selection, as I had alluded to uh, before we listen to the March 21st conversation, because that conversation would so change Jaworski's view. On November 17th, uh, Nixon decided that he, the press was getting so out of hand that he had to try to calm this situation, that he was agreeing to now to turn the tapes over, and he was going to turn a new leaf and, and, and lower the, the temperature by explaining what he was doing. So he met with an association of news editors at all places, Disney World, here's the clip that is most memorable. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. President? Yes, sir. Fairly interesting body language there. Anyway, the plan is the next day he was really setting up the fact that he was going to start releasing tapes. So what happens when it comes time to release the tapes? They've got to go to Judge Sirica on November 21st and tell the judge there's an 18 and a half minute gap in the June 20th conversation. This, again, a whole new round of, of headlines uh, disclosing the, the gap. I think that Herb Block, who was not Richard Nixon's favorite cartoonist from the Washington Post, uh, captured a lot of the mood of the moment in this uh, particular cartoon. Again, Nixon fought for a while until he realized when the House Judiciary Committee, which had then, by then, gotten very serious about impeachment proceedings and undertaken them and sent a subpoena, that they did have jurisdiction. If anybody at all had jurisdiction to get these tapes that Nixon had no defense against, it was the body who had exclusive jurisdiction to investigate potential wrongdoing by a president being the House Judiciary Committee. So he decides to release the tapes. Um, this is a very staged event. You see these, this stack of books here? Uh, some of these only had two or three conversations. You can get a little peek inside there. They didn't begin to fill, uh, but this was done for the theater to give the impression that literally stacks of books of tapes were being released. The actual book itself was about two and a half, maybe even three inches when they were all uh, printed on both sides and released. Here's Nixon's statement. Good evening. I have asked for this time tonight in order to announce my answer to the House Judiciary Committee's subpoena for additional Watergate tapes and to tell you something about the actions I shall be taking tomorrow. These actions will at last, once and for all, show that what I knew and what I did with regard to the Watergate break-in and cover-up were just as I have described them to you from the very beginning. The full resources of the FBI and the Justice Department were used to investigate the incident thoroughly. For nine months, until March 1973, I was assured by those charged with conducting and monitoring the investigations that no one in the White House was involved. As far as what the President personally knew and did with regard to Watergate, 
and the cover-up is concerned, these materials, together with those already made available, will tell it all. Ever since the existence of the White House taping system was first made known last summer, I have tried vigorously to guard the privacy of the tapes. I've been well aware that my effort to protect the confidentiality of presidential conversations has heightened the sense of mystery about Watergate and, in fact, has caused increased suspicions of the president. The basic question at issue today is whether the president personally acted improperly in the Watergate matter. Month after month of rumor, insinuation, and charges by just one Watergate witness, John Dean, suggested that the president did act improperly. This sparked the demands for an impeachment inquiry. This is the question that must be answered, and this is the question that will be answered by these transcripts that I have ordered published tomorrow. Despite the confusions and contradictions, what does come through clearly is this. John Dean charged in sworn Senate testimony that I was fully aware of the cover-up at the time of our first meeting on September 15, 1972. These transcripts show clearly that I first learned of it when Mr. Dean himself told me about it in this office on March 21st, some six months later. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, uh, <laughs> fortunately. The, uh, what happened is Jaworski uh, was not going to take a pass on his ability to get the tapes. He not only read what he read, uh, including the fact that the transcripts were less than accurate, uh, the House uh, Judiciary Committee, in addition, uh, had a very interesting approach to have retranscripts uh, prepared. They, they called in people who were blind and used them to make transcripts because they had more sensitive hearing and came up with many, many improvements in the, uh, in the tapes. Uh, so they, they put out a, a document that showed tremendous gaps in what Nixon had actually put in his transcripts. But it was the, it was the Jaworski case uh, that went on to the Supreme Court for 64 additional tape conversations uh, that would really cause the problems for Nixon, because that would reach for tapes like the tape on June 25th, where Nixon orders the CIA intervene and cut off the FBI. Indeed, that tape alone would put the lie to, uh, to Nixon's defense. So after 25 months of cover-up, it ended. When Nixon was told by the Supreme Court, 8 to 0, that he had to release the tapes. It was 8 0 rather than 9 0 because Rehnquist uh, was the judge, justice who recused himself because of his relationship with John Mitchell, uh, thinking he was too close to it. That would in turn would result within days in Nixon's resignation. Uh, he would lose the support of the handful of Republicans on the impeachment committee who had not voted for impeachment, so it would become unanimous of the House impeachment committee to recommend to the House there be impeachment. Uh, when Senators Goldwater and uh, the other leaders of the Republican Party in the Senate went down to advise the Senate, advise the president of what the, the temperature was in the Senate, Goldwater said he could not find one vote for Nixon, including his own, if it went over to the Senate. Nixon uh, resigns on the 9th, uh, and I think, though, when he called his staff uh, in the next morning as he was leaving, he got it. He understood, uh, for at least a fleeting moment, what had gone wrong. And I think this clip kind of captures it.
It's only a beginning, always. The young must know it. The old must know it. It must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. And so I say to you on this occasion, we leave. We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. And so we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility. Thank you very much. That, however, was not the end of the story. The next month, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and several others would go on trial for the cover-up. That trial would last until January 1 of the next year when the jury would return its verdict, convicting Mitchell, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Mardian. They did acquit Parkinson, one of the lawyers from uh, the re-election committee, in what was a brilliant defense of just not saying anything uh, and staying in a corner of the courtroom where almost he was overlooked. Uh, but like in Nixon's resignations, uh, the tapes played a major role in the conviction of, of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and Mardian. Uh, discovery and production of the tapes, to me, was inevitable to answer the initial question. Just too many people knew about it that sooner or later they were going to stumble into it. And it would have, one way or the other, certainly ended Watergate. On that note, let's end this class. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out our latest podcast, First Ladies in Their Own Words. Using material from C-SPAN's award-winning biography series, First Ladies, and source material from C-SPAN's video library, you'll listen to first spouses addressing issues important to them and the country. The program includes eight First Ladies, from Lady Bird Johnson to Melania Trump. Find First Ladies in their own words wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>